first time. Welcome everyone to Calvary Assembly. It is great to be together to recognize the Lord and his ministry among us because that's what the Lord does, you know. He came to be a minister and he ministered on earth for three and a half years, apart from his life before that. And he did what could not be done by anyone else. And that is he died for our sins. We praise him, we worship him, we thank him for doing that for each one of us. And so to those that are online today, welcome. We've had a good time of praise and worship here. And it's a pity you couldn't be with us, but nevertheless, we are now going to be speaking about uh, what I have on my mind, what I believe the Lord has led me to speak about today. You know that um, Thursday just passed was Ascension Day, where we recognize the Lord's going into heaven. When the disciples stood there and saw Jesus go up into the clouds, but the most important thing that I feel about Ascension Day is the fact that the angels then spoke and said, why do you look for this man going up into the clouds? Don't you realize the same Jesus will come back again in the same way to fetch us? And so to me, Ascension Day always speaks of two things, the going of joy, Jesus back into glory from whence he came and seated at the right hand of God the Father, but also the assurance of the fact that he's coming back for us and he's preparing a house for you personally. Isn't that wonderful? That's something to celebrate. Amen. But as he went away, he left an instruction for his disciples. He said, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. You know, long before you go back to Galilee and go fishing. I want you to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father is what I want to speak to you about today. The promise of the Father would come 10 days later, and that is next Sunday. But I'm going to be away on holiday next Sunday, Mercy and I. And so I won't be here on Pentecost Sunday, which is next Sunday. And I want to speak to you today as though it is Pentecost Sunday as though it is also Ascension Day. We remember what I've said about Ascension Day, that Jesus is sending his spirit. Not only did he go, but he said, I'm coming back. But he also, before he went, on a numerous occasions, said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send the spirit. Sometimes he said, the Father will send the spirit. There were other times when he said, I will send the spirit. And so the Holy Spirit coming upon the church is what we celebrate on Pentecost Sunday all over the world. And I want to celebrate that today because of the fact that we won't be here next Sunday. Hopefully we'll be with you next Sunday. I hope to go to your church next Sunday, but we'll be in the Mams and Doty. So we'll come online and uh, we'll be with you uh, in, in, in that way. But I want to speak today about the promise of the Father. This is a wonderful occasion when we remember what happened on that Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. That little picture you see on the screen, you see men and women, and even Jesus' mother Mary was in that group. And on that Pentecost Sunday, the mighty rushing wind came upon them, and the tongues of fire settled on each one of them. And these people were totally transformed and changed. They became different people. They became totally renewed. They became what we long for when we pray for revival. Every Friday night, as I've encouraged you today to please come to the prayer meeting on a Friday night, whether you come for 10 minutes or for a whole hour, doesn't matter. We just need people to pray for the revival to hit South Africa and in fact, Calvary Assembly. And so today, we think of that, and I want to speak about what Jesus um, explained when he told them he's going to, they're going to wait for the gift of the Father. There were two scriptures I'm going to read, one in Luke 24, and the other one in Acts chapter 1, if you want to go to your own Bibles. But in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, just one verse, 
I'll put up on the screen. In the New International Version, Jesus says it this way. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's what Jesus said before he went up into heaven. This is one of the things that he said to his disciples, as recorded by the, the, the writer Luke. And then in Acts chapter 1, also written by Luke, by the doctor, in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for God baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That word with, I think in the Greek it's er, it could be translated in. So it's equally correct to say that you will be baptized in water and you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So whether it's with or in, both are correct. So we, were, we are at, uh, uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, and we are baptized in water and with water and into Christ. That's what we are as the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Those were the words of Jesus that we've looked at very carefully. And so I want to speak about those, that promise of the Father in three different ways. The first of them is the purpose. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit being with us? Well, Jesus explained in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said it this way, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Be my witnesses. I've highlighted those words by putting them in bold print. You will be my witnesses. So that's what it means to be filled with God's Spirit. You will be my witnesses. In other words, you, he's not saying you will go and witness. He's saying you will be my witness. And it's something along the lines that I just charged Peter with, to be what God wants him to be. And all the elders and deacons and everybody in the church out there to be at your workplace and in your community, not to do, but to be, to be God's witness, not a Jehovah's witness, a Jesus witness. And so that's the primary purpose. But of course, many things come out of that when you are a witness for Jesus. So then, let me ask you a question. What in your mind is the difference between a witness and a missionary? In my mind, there's no difference. No difference at all. I see every one of you as a missionary. The moment you go out of the door, you're entering into the mission field. In fact, some churches actually put that up as a, as a sign inside the door of the outgoing side of the door into their church. You are now entering the mission field. I don't see any difference between a missionary and a witness for Jesus, because that's what I believe we are all called to be. And so the Great Commission then is for who? All of us. It's for all of us. It's in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. And behold, I will be with you to the end of the age. He also says it in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. In fact, I'll read Mark 15, uh, 15 and 16 of the 16th chapter of Mark. He says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. 
That's what Jesus is telling us to do, beloved. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. Will you take those words and allow them to sink into your spirit today, not only about those who believe and who will be saved and who will have eternity in heaven, but also the part where Jesus said, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Do you know what kind of an emotion that should make you and I or create in each one of us? What should, sort of emotion should that arouse in you and I when we read those words, whoever does not believe will be condemned? There was a man by the name of William Carey who thought of pagans going to be condemned in eternity caused him to actually break down when he was teaching. He was teaching in universities and schools and things like that, although you'll see in a few minutes' time, he only had a formal education up to grade eight. But further than that, he, he educated himself. And this man, who's known as the, the father of modern missions, was so concerned about that fact that the pagans of this world, the unbelievers of this world, the people who have false religions of this world are going to a lost eternity forever and ever and ever. And he would break down in tears while he was preaching. And he would point to the map while he's teaching geography and say, those people in India, they, they're going to hell and there's nobody telling them about Jesus. And he longed to go to India to go and preach the gospel. And the Mission Society in England said, no, you're undereducated, you're underfunded, you're incapable, you can't go. So they wouldn't send him, but he went anyway, and he became known as the father of modern missions. He had a grade eight education, but he taught himself Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, and Dutch. You know, this man started over 100 schools with over 8,000 children in India, changing their lives, not just teaching them one plus one equals two, mathematics and English and all that sort of thing. He taught them the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He birthed in India the church of Jesus Christ. All because he read those words where Jesus said, those who do not believe will be condemned forever. What does that do to you and I when you think of Nelspray people going to hell? Beloved, it should make us weep for them. How can we expect anybody to go through life and end up in hell forever? You see, he was driven by the Holy Spirit he had something of the same spirit that was in Paul, who said, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. That was the attitude of Paul. I don't care what I have to do, but I want to save some people. I don't care if I have to go to prison. I don't care if I have to go in ships that are not very safe and I get shipwrecked. I don't care if I have to go to the uttermost parts of the known earth at that time, but I've got to save some. That was the attitude of Paul. And William Carey was the same. And may I suggest today, beloved, that you and I should also have that spirit in us. A man by the name of William Wilberforce was influenced by George Whitfield and John Newton, he lived in their era, and he fought tirelessly to abolish slave trading in England. He went into politics just for that purpose, mainly to abolish slave trading. Not only did he want to abolish it and set them free so that they could then go to hell, he wanted to abolish slavery, but he also wanted them to know about Jesus. And so he had that in his, in, his, in his DNA, that this is what he longed for, this is what he worked for, to set slaves free, but also to get them to know about Jesus. He was inspired by the words of Isaiah, Isaiah 61 and verse 1, words which you will recognize 
the moment I read them. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And of course, those verses, those words were quoted by Jesus and were fulfilled by Jesus. Praise his holy name. And so when we think of people like William Wilberforce fighting in Parliament for the abolishment of slavery, I know that immediately in the world of Christianity today, there are a whole lot that say, you know, my religion is private. You know, uh, you can't speak to them about the Lord because, you know, I, I, I've got my own church. Don't, don't touch me. Uh, I get my acre, you know, and that sort of attitude. And they take the same attitude about politics. Politics is not for Christians. And I want to tell you, beloved, that's as far from the truth as you can possibly get. Christians are called to be involved in every social issue in this community where God has left us. We are to be the change, to be witnesses. You can't be a witness without, in some ways, being involved in a person's social life. That means politics. You see, there were a lot of Christians or a lot of God's people that were involved in politics. Take, for example, Joseph became prime minister of Egypt. At the time when Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth, it's equivalent to being the president of the United States of America. That's the position that Joseph had. That's politics. What about Samuel, Nathan, Elisha, Isaiah, uh, Elisha, Ezra, um, Nehemiah, all of these men and many women as well, Ruth and, and, uh, and Naomi and all these different men and women were involved in the social issues of the days that they lived in. Some of them even gave advice to the kings of the country. Many times the kings of the country would go to a prophet or to a priest to get information. That's involved in politics. Beloved, we should not be silent about things like abortion. We are equipped by, as Christians to be the conscience of and the voice of the nation. And so we cannot be silent about abortion. How can we be silent when, when millions of babies are being killed in the womb? Babies that have a heartbeat. Babies that feel pain. And we tear them apart. How can we be quiet about that and act as though it's just normal? Oh, abortion's legal, so it's okay. No, it's not okay. Not with God. It's not okay. And so we need to recognize the fact, beloved, that the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives is to change us, to become witnesses, not only to go out and tell people about Jesus, but to really be a changed person, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's what you are. The second point is the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you recognize the power of the Holy Spirit among us? You see, do, do you see some some magical work or something like that? Well, I think the Bible tells us where the power is, the source of the power. You see, Zechariah in the Old Testament, in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, said it this way. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. God telling Zerubbabel, this is my word to you. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Do we recognize that that is the source of the power of every single move of God throughout the world? So many times the modern church has started to manufacture some kind of revival, as they call it, and they have programs which attract a lot of people, and they call it a revival. But you see, there's, there's something about some of it that, that there's something wrong. For instance, when, when I hear about the prosperity gospel, I think to myself now, Tell me something. If a person says, I'm trusting God for a million rand in my bank account, 
Is that faith in God? Or is my faith manipulating God? Do we really think that God is subject to my faith? Do you think that my faith can twist the hand of God to do something he doesn't intend to do? Faith is supposed to come alongside God to recognize what God wants done and to say, that's what I'm going to believe. If I believe what God has said is going to happen, believe me, there's nothing in this world that can stop it happening. If God has said it, it will happen. If it's God's intention for you to go into the mission field in India or in China, believe me, it doesn't matter how many COVID-19 restrictions there are. If you believe it, you will get there. Because if God's called you, God will get you there. That's faith. Believing what God wants in your life. And believing that God can and will perform it. Jesus said, if you see this mountain's in the way, then tell that mountain to get out of the way. And it will go. No matter what difficulties there are in our lives, we can and will have faith to believe that we can perform anything God wants us to perform. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 7 said, Yet I will show the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, not by sword, or battle, or horses, or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. You see, we must recognize that the power of the Holy Spirit is, the, is God himself. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the triune God. God the Holy Spirit is not an appendage of God. It is God himself. God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son. It is God. And the Holy Spirit is the one that moves when the Holy Spirit comes into the fullness of your life. And you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And Jesus also said in the Luke chapter that I read earlier, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. That is how he performs the miracles, the power. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. Not by might. Not by power. Not by your efforts. Not by your intellect. Not by your education. Not by your willpower but by God's Spirit. That's what being filled with the Spirit is all about. Just to lighten it a little bit, let me read something to you that Mark Twain, the well-known writer, wrote about discord. In other words, he looked at the world and he saw what we see today. Discord. You know, nothing's working properly. In every country in the world, it doesn't matter whether you go to America or England or anywhere, you're going to find potholes in the road. You're going to find corruption. You're going to find break-ins. You're going to find men lying, women lying. You're going to find discord everywhere. Mark Twain looked at it in his day and he said, I'm tired of all this discord. And so this is what he said. Of course, it's an imaginary thing, but you can, you can take it uh, and just listen to it because... It's quite clever. He said, I built a cage, and in it, a dog and a cat. After a little training, I got the dog and cat to the point where they lived peaceably together. Then I introduced a pig, and a goat, and a kangaroo, some birds, and a monkey. After a few adjustments, they learned to live in harmony together. Now, isn't it amazing that you can actually get all these different animals living together when they are trained to do so? Of course, he's talking imaginary now. But then he went on to say this. So encouraged was I by such successes that I added an Irish Catholic and a Presbyterian and a Jew and a Muslim from Turkestan and a Buddhist from China, along with a Baptist missionary that I captured on the same trip. All of them in one cage with those animals. And in a very short while, 
there wasn't a single living thing left in the cage. Now, I know it's a bit of humor, but doesn't that just highlight what Jesus said? Without me, you can do nothing. The world is in a mess because it doesn't want to recognize Jesus. The only place I see things operating correctly is the church of Jesus Christ. The only place where I see honesty and love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness and people living and working together regardless of their backgrounds. Isn't it wonderful to be in a church where you can look around and see so many people from different backgrounds and we are one in Christ. We are one family. Hallelujah. It's so true. Mark Twain, you might have been joking, but you know, that was truth, that you put them all together and very soon they'd all just kill each other. But if we recognize that with Jesus, I can do all things. With Christ, I can do all things. When united, humans have incredible power. God recognized that. God put it into the Bible so that we would know it. In the, in the Tower of Babel, he said, if these people all work together, there's nothing they can't do. And so he divided them because they were trying to get to heaven without God. They were trying to do it all in their own strength. And so many people today are building their Tower of Babel in their own lives, trying to build their lives by being a good person, by turning over a new leaf, by reading this motivational book and that motivational video. And we do everything in our power to be better people. Beloved, without Christ, you can do nothing. With Christ, you can do all things that he wants you to do. We end up killing each other, destroying each other. A preacher by the name of Billy Strathorn, he said, I remember an old story about a little boy who was helping dad with the work in the yard. Dad asked him to pick up rocks in a certain area of the yard. Dad looked over and saw him struggling with a big rock, a huge rock buried in the dirt. And dad stood there and watched him. And the boy struggled and struggled while dad watched. There was the little boy battling to get that rock out of the ground and dad just stood and watched him. And then dad said, the boy gave up and he said, I can't do it. And so dad said to him, did you use all your strength? And the little boy said, yes, dad. I used every ounce of strength I've got. And he was hurt about dad asking him, did you try hard enough? Did you use all your strength? And then the father smiled and he said, no, you didn't use all your strength. You didn't ask me to help you. There's a spiritual lesson in that, beloved. Are you battling to live a good life? And you can't. There are things that you can't get out of your life that you wish you could. There are things that you do. What Paul said, I do what I shouldn't do. In Romans chapter 7. I do what I shouldn't do. And those things that I know I, 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 I shouldn't do, I do them. And the things that I should do, I don't do them. That's what Paul said. The great apostle Paul. Do you have that in your life? What have you asked him to help? You see, the Father standing watching us trying to build our own lives and to make our own lives righteous and holy. And he says, why don't you ask me to help you? That's what that little boy should have done. Asked his dad to help him move the rock. And the two of them pulled the rock out of the dirt without any problems. What a great biblical truth that is in our lives for those things that seem impossible, that you can't do what you should do and you can't stop doing what you shouldn't do. Liberty and success come through being yoked with Christ. You see, the power of Christians lies in those words 
that I read of Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. And so I want to come to point number three, the presence. And by presence, I don't mean the present time, I mean presence, the presence of God. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end. The Father said, I will never leave you or forsake you. How does this happen in real terms? That you Do you see the Holy Spirit come into your life? How does it really happen? You see, Jesus explained it this way. He said to his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. The gift my Father promised. It's a gift that the Father promised. Father promised to every one of us, which you've heard me speak about, which means that Jesus wasn't telling them the first time about the Holy Spirit. Way before he went to the cross, many times he referred to the Holy Spirit. He said, I will not leave you as often. I will send the comforter. He spoke many times about the Holy Spirit before he went to the cross. He said, you've heard me talk about it many times. This is the gift my Father promised. Wait for it in Jerusalem, is what Jesus said. And what happened? Consider Peter, the cowardly denials, and of how his courage was just multiplied 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he spoke to those people, 3,000 of them were saved. And they came saying, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said to them, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's basically what he said in chapter 2 of Acts and verses 38 and 39. Filled with confidence. Filled with purpose. Filled with power. Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus explained what would happen to them. He said it this way, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. He was saying something which was not only an event. It was a happening, beloved. It's not a one-time event. So many people have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and they get baptized and they have the evidence of speaking in tongues and then they never speak in tongues again. So many people are filled with the Holy Spirit and two weeks later you won't even know that they are different people. The Holy Spirit is needed to come afresh day by day by day. Re-infilling whenever it is needed in order to live the kind of life God wants you to live. Did this happen in the early church? Oh yes it did. There are scriptural examples of the Holy Spirit working in the church. In one place in, in Acts chapter 217 and again in 1045, it says that the Spirit was poured out on the people. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 16 and 1044, it says the Spirit fell on them. In Acts chapter 916, it says the Spirit came on them. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and other scriptures you see on the screen, it says the Spirit filled them. Again and again, the Holy Spirit came upon them. In different times that they had different needs, the Holy Spirit came. He fell. He poured out upon them. Beloved, we need the Holy Spirit every single day. I cannot expect myself to live God's way one day without the Holy Spirit filling me for that day. I need to be filled again and again. You see, Christians have a tendency to be drawn back to what they were before. That's a human tendency. In fact, Jesus recognized that. And he said, don't go back to the world. Remember Lot's wife. Why do you think he said, remember Lot's wife? Because Lot's wife looked back at Sodom with some kind of longing for her. She was leaving something behind she didn't want to leave behind. And Jesus said that about us 
going back to the worldly things, remember Lot's wife that will be judged. But you see, Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So may I put it to you that there's more that we need to remember of what happened before than Lot's wife. What about Moses' rod and Aaron's rod? All the miracles that came about with the use of that rod. What about Elijah and then Elisha, the cloak of Elijah, which was passed on to Elisha? Elijah used his cloak and he hit the water of the, of the river Jordan and it separated and he walked through. And, and when he got through to the other side and he was taken up with the chariots uh, of fire and he threw his cloak down and fell upon Elisha, Elisha took that cloak and went to the river. He said, now where's the God of Elijah? And he hit the water and the water separated and he walked through on dry ground. The rod, the cloak, Lot's wife, they are indications of God's power. And now, let me hasten to say that so often we like to see and use things. You know, you, you don't see the Holy Spirit. And so I've seen films of these guys that think that they can cast out demons and they take a cross, a wooden cross or a, a molded cross with Jesus on it. And, and they show this to the person who's, who's full of the spirit, as if there's some power in that piece of wood or in that piece of metal. Uh, is there power in that piece of wood there that is a cross or those two on the wall? Is there latent power in the wood? No, beloved. That's a reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross. When we go to the foot of the cross, we go to the person that that cross represents. When we partake of the emblems, I always say to you, this is not a tradition of just taking a piece of bread and a bit of uh, the cup of wine and, and drinking it and, and thinking that there's some magical power in it. The power is in the person of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit. We don't see the Holy Spirit. So what then do we have in place of Moses' rod, Elijah's cloak. What, what do we have? The, the, is it the cross? Do we have to have an object of some sort? No. We have prayer, an acknowledgement of God in the name of Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. When you pray in the name of Jesus, all of those scriptures that are on the board there, I, I think I'm, I'm going to just turn to a few in John and read a couple of these scriptures to you in John. Uh, let me see, where's John chapter 14 and verse 13. And that says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And then in the next chapter, 15, verse 16, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love one another. In the next chapter, he says, In that day you will ask in my name. And a couple of chapters later, in chapter 20 and verse 31, it says, but these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. We have the name of Jesus. Beloved, I want to just quickly say to you, people think that a magician uses the words abracadabra. And so the, the name in the name of Jesus is like abracadabra. No, it's not. You don't say the words like it's a magical formula. You say the words in the name of Jesus by pulling Jesus, the person, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into that prayer. When I pray in the name of Jesus, it, it troubles me every time I see on, on film so often in the film. You, you see them praying, and then when they get to the end of their prayer, they say, Amen. 
And I say, but what about in the name of Jesus? And I don't want it to be a formula. I want it to be a reality. That I say it in the name of Jesus because I'm acknowledging the presence of Jesus. When I say we meet here on a Sunday morning in the name of Jesus, it's not a formula, beloved. It's the reality of the presence of Jesus by his spirit. Is he here today? Do you really, you personally, feel that Jesus is here today? Do you really? Is he real to you where you are sitting today? You see, that's what we have. We don't need, need a rod. We don't need a cloak. We don't need a cross. We don't need some object, a picture of Mary or a picture of Jesus. We need the reality of the presence of Jesus in the Spirit. That's what being baptized in the Holy Spirit is all about. Finally, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. He's here today. Jesus explained the promise of the Father in the words that I read earlier. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. Wait for it. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses all over the world. Beloved, I'm going to close by praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon every person listening to my voice. Not once, but again, and again, and again. And every time you need God's help, may that spirit come upon you. I'm going to pray for that power to be poured out, to fall upon you, to come upon you, to fill you, all those things that we saw in the book of Acts. If you want that this morning, you want me to pray for you, then I'm going to invite you to stand, but not yet. Before you stand, I want to just close by telling you that for today, I believe that the triune God is here to do in our lives these three things. The Father is here today to love you, to be merciful, and to forgive you. That's the role of the Father, I believe, here today. And the Son, to give you salvation and justification. Justification means just as if I had never sinned. That's what Jesus is here to do for you today. But I'm wanting to focus on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you sanctification. You see, Jesus saved you once and for all. It's a faith in the name of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, that got you saved, born again. You never need another name or another experience other than Jesus. But God doesn't want to leave you there. You see, that's salvation. That's justification, one time happening. But sanctification is an ongoing thing. Every one of us need to be sanctified. You see, that's the job of the Holy Spirit, producing Christ-likeness in us. Now you need to think about whether you want to stand and ask me to pray for you, that you receive this Holy Spirit who will sanctify you day by day. Day by day. I believe every one of us need that. Will you stand as our closing prayer today? If you want that Holy Spirit to come upon you, beloved, not for a one time happening, but on a daily basis, every single day, Holy Spirit, fall upon me in everything that I need to be able to be the person. You want me to be, oh God, see this congregation and these people at home. I hope you're standing people at home. Oh, 
Beloved, God, the Holy Spirit is here today to touch your life in a new and a fresh way. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for the falling upon us of the Holy Spirit, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit into the lives of every single person who's standing here today, Lord, and those standing at home and those who listen to the they the report afterwards and they are filled with the Holy Spirit even after they've heard this on the, on the internet. I pray for each and every one of them to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, fill us again, Lord. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please be seated. Worship team, if you'll come to the front. And as we come up to the front, I want to close the service by saying, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.